Hello everyone, welcome to part four of Sean Chick's Life of Napoleon Bonaparte. After assuming the throne and building the greatest army of the gunpowder era, Napoleon's armies unleashed destruction on France's enemies. At Ulm, Austerlitz, Jena, and Friedland, we see Napoleon, his marshals, and his troops all at their peak. It was during this period that Napoleon secured his place in world history and his slot as one of the great captains. Yet, these victories came at a cost. By 1809, the quality of Napoleon's men was declining due to losses in battle, which made Napoleon less confident in their reliability. This in turn led to costlier mass assaults, which further lowered the quality of his men by driving up the body count yet higher. With Jean Lenay dead and men like André Massena aging out, Napoleon's vaunted set of commanders was also declining in quality. Now, Napoleon's arrogance will overtake his confidence, the decline of his army will become serious enough to have battlefield consequences, and his earlier decision to intervene in Iberia will come back to haunt him. While Napoleon sat in his palace at Paris overeating, and his armies were suffering from attrition in Spain, his international enemies are quietly but assiduously preparing to renew the struggle with the Corsican turned French emperor. Today, we see that struggle play out from Germany to Iberia to the plains of Russia and back to Germany again. Decadence and Decay The Treaty of Schönbrunn was perhaps the harshest peace Napoleon ever imposed, not counting the ongoing war in Spain. Austria gave land to France, Russia, and Bavaria. The negotiations were punctured by an assassination attempt when Friedrich Stops tried to stab Bonaparte. Stops then refused a tacit and personal pardon from Napoleon. Upon his execution, he shouted, Long live freedom! Long live Germany! The French Revolution had destroyed the legitimacy of monarchies and replaced it with the nation. Napoleon took this further as he humbled the great families of Europe. Yet, while the people were turning away from kings in favor of nationalism, Napoleon marched ever closer toward the trappings of monarchy. While the peace with Austria was harsh, it still left that kingdom intact and able to fight. Napoleon, though, believed he had humbled them and could bind the most conservative nobility in Europe to his star. The march into monarchy continued with the divorce of Josephine. She was paid off in grand style, but Napoleon gave her little attention in the coming years. His thoughts instead turned towards a new wife. He preferred a Russian princess, no doubt to secure his flank. Alexander delayed, and in the void the Austrians offered Maria Louise. She was an immature girl, pretty but shallow, lacking the wit, charm, and warmth of Josephine. Napoleon assented, and the marriage made him happy. He could indulge himself more with Marie. Best of all, she bore him a son, the future Napoleon II. With his new wife and child, and after years of constant war and politics, Napoleon succumbed to the court life he had crafted. The first assassination attempt led him to become emperor. The second caused him to embrace the role. He had always eaten little and thus stayed in shape, but the effect of a sedentary life made him fat. Fine foods and wine entered his dinner plans. Like a bourbon king, he went on hunting trips, although he was a terrible huntsman. He became more humorless and less incisive in his thoughts. He slowed the pace of reform that marked the days of his consulship. He left the war in Spain to his generals in the years of 1810 and 1811. Napoleon, the general and dynamic leader, had at last given way to Napoleon, the monarch. Before 1809, Napoleon would listen to contrary opinions. He sought the best men. Increasingly, the government was filled with administrators whose talent was efficiency and loyalty. Among the marshals, a decline of ability was beginning with Napoleon confessing that even the trusted Murat was a very brave man in the field of battle, but he is more cowardly than a woman or a monk when not in the presence of the enemy. He has no moral courage. Berthia, called the emperor's wife, was mistreated and mocked, which in turn led to a decline in his performance. 
In France, censorship grew, and conservatives and Republicans both chafed. Both felt the early promise of Napoleon fade away. Old allies such as Talleyrand became active enemies. Most simply became neutral. It was not that Napoleon was particularly oppressive, or that France under him was lacking in innovation. Nicephore Nipsey invented the first combustible engine in 1807. In 1809, Nicholas Appert discovered that jarred food lasted longer. By 1810, canning was being tested, and by 1814, it was being used in the French army. Innovation was possible in the empire. Rather, a slow administrative decay and a kind of simmering antipathy pervaded the nation. The old excitement of the consulship and Austerlitz had worn off. This antipathy was not outright rage. After all, under Napoleon, jobs were plentiful, wars were won, and banditry was kept in check. He could still rely upon the support of the army and the bourgeoisie, who benefited from lax regulation, low taxes, the Napoleonic Code, and Napoleon's attack on trade unions. Still, military service was evaded by many, and Napoleon's once broad support among the lower class declined. The spirit of royalism and republicanism never faded away. Indeed, both groups hoped that exiles would return to save them, with the royalists pinning their hopes on the obese Louis XVIII, who was tucked away in Britain. Moreau was the hero the republicans sought. Even worse, old friends such as Marmo doubted if Napoleon was still the same man. In the countryside, men dodged the draft and workers grumbled. Napoleon had placed a disproportionate burden of taxes and military service on the allied provinces. They, too, showed signs of strain. The same strain, this feeling that the empire was stagnating, could be seen in the ongoing war in Spain. The Spanish Ulcer Joseph, who never wanted the Spanish throne, told his brother, Your glory will be shipwrecked in Spain. My tomb will be a monument to your lack of power to support me. It was a prophetic statement. Napoleon's departure from Spain did not end the ravages of war. Spanish guerrillas continued to attack French troops, and without Napoleon's presence, the French generals bickered. Although the Spanish troops were, outside of a few elite regiments, poorly led and trained, the failure of Napoleon's officers to coordinate made destroying the Spanish army impossible. Brilliant victories could be won, and in a straight fight, guerrillas and partisans were hardly a match. However, there was no end to the partisans, and much of this had to do with French depravity. Murder, thievery, and rape were too common. Many French generals stole liberally, and Sewell himself planned to become king of Portugal. Napoleon's penchant for giving out rewards had made his men, and particularly his generals, greedy and used to a lavish living. The Spanish reacted to avarice and brutality with no holds barred fighting. In an era of seemingly constant warfare, the battles for Spain were widely considered the most savage. Although the British army had been evacuated in 1808, they returned in the spring of 1809. The British now had the steady hand of Wellesley, a stern man but a brilliant tactician. He was utterly fearless in regards to the French. To one friend, he said, they have a new system of strategy which has outmaneuvered and overwhelmed all of the armies of Europe. They may overwhelm me, but I don't think they will outmaneuver me. First, because I am not afraid of them, as everyone else seems to be, and secondly, because if what I hear of their system of maneuver is true, I think it is a false one as against steady troops. I suspect all the continental armies were more than half beaten before the battle was begun. I, at least will not be frightened beforehand. He was certainly not a perfect soldier, and contrary to British myth, he did lose some battles. Still, his methods were perfect for fighting the French. The British army itself, although small and often led by mediocre officers, had perhaps the best foot soldiers around. They were on a whole professional, loyal to their regiment, and mercilessly drilled. Best of all, Britain's wealth allowed the small army to practice shooting in a way few soldiers could in other armies. In general, the British proved to be the better marksmen and steady 
under pressure. Wellington, as he was known after his victory at Talavera, could thus threaten the French with a small but elite army. The French therefore had to keep enough troops to fight in a regular war and contain the British. It was a difficult situation for any general, and only good luck or Napoleon himself could win the day. Still, the French army was led by able generals. Many of Napoleon's best units were committed to the war, and among Spain's liberals, French rule gained wide support. Although Joseph was clearly not a great king, his support for reform probably made his position stronger than it should have been. Suchet proved in eastern Spain that competent administration, supported by good generalship and judicious use of force, could maintain French dominance. With neither side holding a decisive advantage, the war dragged on, ebbing back and forth. Wellington's victory at Talavera was limited by French victories elsewhere. Although Sewell won a smashing victory at Ocana, he could not take Cadiz. In 1810, Napoleon could not uh, chose not to lead the invasion of Portugal. Instead, he sent Massena, who, although fresh from another brilliant performance at Wagram, was feeling exhausted. Although defeated in several battles and undermined by subordinates and colleagues, Massena drove all the way to the gates of Lisbon. Wellington, though, had fortified the city, and with a constant flow of supplies from the city, Wellington was able to hold out. In 1811, Massena's army melted away, and Wellington reclaimed all of Portugal. However, the twin battles of Fuentes de Enoro and Albuera were too indecisive to grant either side an advantage. In 1812, the French prepared to renew the offensive, this time with Marmot leading the way. As usual, a lack of forage and Spanish guerrillas sapped his army's strength. At Salamanca, Marmot was wounded and his army was driven off. Wellington marched into Madrid, but at, at Talavera, he overextended himself. His defeat at Burgos forced him all the way back to Portugal. Still, the French had to abandon northwestern and southwestern Spain, and Madrid was vulnerable. Although Burgos resurrected French hopes, it was obvious that the war in Spain had crippled Napoleon. He even later admitted, That unfortunate war destroyed me. My disasters are bound up in that fatal knot. Yet, without a victory elsewhere in Europe, the Peninsular War, as it was known in Britain, would prove fruitless. It was, in essence, a holding action. Wellington could not conquer France, even with the entire Spanish army on his side. Austria and Prussia were too weak to alter the situation. All eyes turned to Russia. 1812 Overture While Napoleon left Messina to finish the work in Spain and Portugal, he tried feverishly to repair the deteriorating situation with Russia. It was a pointless effort. Anti-French sentiment in Russia was too high, and her people desired British goods more than French ones. In 1811, Russia restored formal trade with Britain. The army was massed, and Russian generals hoped to invade the French Empire once again. Napoleon moved quickly by massing troops and offering fresh threats and peace overtures. By 1812, though, War was imminent, and Napoleon quickly gathered the largest army Europe had ever seen, hoping that it might at last bring Russia to the peace table before an invasion could be launched. Along with his new foreign minister, Hugh Bernard Marais, Napoleon went on a diplomatic blitz. Together they dragooned Austria and Prussia into sending men to fight. The army, of, the army was drawn from across Europe, and even included regiments from lands as far away as Spain and Croatia. Only half of the horde Napoleon amassed was French. These 600,000 soldiers outnumbered what the Russians could field. Yet, Alexander did not panic. Russia secured peace with the Ottoman Empire and Sweden, securing the flanks and freeing up troops. The Russians were emboldened by Eylau, Aspern Essling, and the Peninsular War and they believed they could defeat Napoleon in a straight fight. Russian hopes would have hardly mattered if Napoleon was the same man as before, but he was not. Two years of soft living had made him a homebody. He was now unused to camp life, and the same Bonaparte who had mingled freely with his men before Austerlitz now withdrew to his tent. It was partly due to embarrassment. He was now fat, 
which made him slightly effeminate in appearance and unable to fit into his old dress uniform. His once great powers of concentration had left him. He was now given to illness, fatigue, lapses of memory, and then attention. His former daring had become caution, as he massed his army and fruitlessly waited for events to unfold. He rightly feared the expanse of Russia, yet he was willing to go all the way if need be. When he did invade, he left too much responsibility with the indolent Jerome. The opening moves failed to gain an advantage, and Napoleon's army was drawn into Russia. This was because the main Russian commander, Barclay de Tolly, was so overawed by French numbers that he decided to retreat, although his fellow generals wanted to fight. And following Tolly, Napoleon doomed his army. His forces were organized to live off the land, an easier prospect in Germany, France, and to a lesser degree Italy. In Russia, the backwards economy mixed with scorched earth tactics and partisan attacks made foraging difficult. Sickness and hunger destroyed the army. In addition, the French staff and administrative systems were overstretched and opportunities to smash the Russians were lost. In an effort to scare Russia into submission, Napoleon had massed too many men and the French cavalry were no longer the vaunted force of 1805 or even 1808. The army was melting away. Napoleon was aided by Russian incompetence. Their generals bickered, and a desperate Alexander was forced to turn to Kutuzov, although the two distrusted each other. Against his judgment, Kutuzov was ordered to turn and fight for Moscow. At Borodino, a massive battle was fought. Napoleon turned down Davout's plan for a flank attack, afraid the Russians might retreat before it could be accomplished. So a series of frontal assaults were made to pin them to the defensive works. The ensuing slaughter ended in a French victory and the fall of Moscow. Russians everywhere panicked and all seemed lost. Kutuzov was too battered to attack, and Napoleon, feeling exhausted and at the edge of the world, simply awaited Alexander's surrender. The Tsar, however, did not budge, and Napoleon failed to accept reality. Although there were amusements, he became agitated and even self-pitying during his stay in Moscow. When one officer commented on how lonely Moscow seemed, Napoleon, his eyes downcast, admitted that it reminded him of his own loneliness. When the first snowflakes fell, Napoleon knew he had to leave. At the same time, Murat was beaten at Tarotino showing that Kutuzov was again ready for battle. If Napoleon stayed any longer, Moscow would become a French tomb. At this point, the invasion was already a disaster. It was up to Napoleon to salvage what he could, or maybe even win a victory in the midst of defeat, as at Austerlitz. Napoleon chose the latter, but an incomplete victory at Malo Yaroslavets ended his hopes. After barely escaping a squad of Cossacks, Napoleon chose to retreat on the advice of his friend, Jean-Baptiste Bessier. Murat argued for a retreat over the ground they had advanced over. Davout suggested a longer and more dangerous route, but one promising better forage. Napoleon sided with Murat. It was a blunder. Food was scarce, and the local populace had formed even larger partisan bands. Combined with the cold, Napoleon's army collapsed into a mob. Kutuzov did not pursue so much as follow. Although his men won victories at Vyazma and Krasnoy, he remained afraid of Napoleon and never closed in for the kill. Seeing disaster, Napoleon was roused from illness and lethargy and was as deadly as he was back in 1797. Along the Berezina River, converging Russian columns were barely held off, and once again Kutuzov failed to drive his men. Napoleon escaped with a corps of veterans and most of his high command. Still, the campaign was a disaster and at one point the French rearguard was made up of Ney, Victor, and less than a hundred men. The Russian campaign made Ney a legend. He was now known as the bravest of the brave, and became so popular that Napoleon increasingly relied upon him. After the Berezina, Napoleon rushed off to France. General Claude Malay, a disappointed Republican, had briefly seized power. Napoleon had to secure his throne and raise a new army, although against the wishes of his entourage, he paused to meet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, one of his favorite authors. 
for the most brilliant general of his age, the Russian experience was a shock. His entire system of warfare had not only failed, it had ended in ruin. When he publicly quipped that there is only one step from the sublime to the ridiculous, he meant it from the bottom of his Corsican heart. The Battle of Nations For a time, there was stalemate. Kutuzov's army was too weak to press on, and the old general opposed invasion. Something of an Anglophobe, he thought Napoleon was useful as a counter to Britain. Then Kutuzov succumbed to his illnesses, and Alexander pressed ahead. Sweden sent troops, and Prussia revolted. Her military had been reformed and rebuilt. It was now led by the Francophobe Gebhard von Blücher, a hard-driving man lacking in skill, but not spirit. Prussian troops joined the Russians in pressing west towards France. Napoleon, though, had not been idle. In the most impressive administrative feat of his career, he scrapped together a large army of conscripts, Peninsular War veterans, and German allies. With this army, he plunged into Germany and won two battles at Lutzen and Bautzen. Neither engagement was decisive, but the victory-drunk coalition was thrown into a panic. Napoleon was still a dangerous opponent. Yet, Napoleon was himself in shock. Old friends were lost in the slaughter, including Duroc and Bessier. The victories were incomplete, and he decided his troops needed more training. So when the coalition offered Napoleon a seven-week truce, he agreed. During this time, he hoped to gather more troops, especially cavalry. However, the high command was in disarray. Ney, the hero of Russia, was essentially shell-shocked, and he was unable to carry out Napoleon's orders. Soule had to be sent back to Spain, and Murat was more worried about his kingdom in Naples than his cavalry corps. Worst of all, Dabu's enemies at court marginalized him, and he was kept out of active command for 1813. Regardless, Lutzen and Bautzen caused much consternation among the coalition parties. The Russian general still bickered, the Prussian army lacked experience, and Sweden was too small to carry the burden. Then, fortune smiled. In Spain, Wellington won a decisive victory at Vitoria, crushing French hopes on the Iberian Peninsula. His army now threatened France's borders, giving the coalition renewed hope. Austria had been considering which side to join, after an interview with Bonaparte, Metternich believed that Napoleon had gone mad and counseled war outright, although he did not support removing Bonaparte from the throne. Francis II sided with Metternich, and Austria joined the coalition. With defeat in Spain forcing him to send troops west, and now Austria in the war, Napoleon was outnumbered. Still, the coalition was fragile, and peace overtures were often made. Napoleon rebuffed them all. Partially, it came from years of duplicity and warmongering from monarchs who called Napoleon a usurper, ogre, thug, and brute. Most of all, Napoleon's overweening confidence was too great. Recalling the Romans after Cannae and their refusal to panic, his arrogance was barely shaken by the disasters in Spain and Russia. He would win it all or nothing at all. Napoleon might have won the war if the coalition had not adopted the Trockenberg Plan. Created by Bernardo, Napoleon's old rival who was now the heir to the Swedish throne, it stipulated that unless at a great advantage, the coalition would avoid attacking Napoleon and concentrate upon the armies led by his marshals. It helped that Davu and Sul were elsewhere, Lan was dead, and Messina was retired. The early weeks of the fighting vindicated the plan. Napoleon won a smashing victory at Dresden. For the pursuit that might have won the war, he sent Dominique René Van Damme. Although morally repulsive, with Napoleon once saying, if I had two of you, the only solution would be to have one hang and keep the other. He was a good fighter. Indeed, Napoleon also said that if he had to invade hell, he'd give Van Damme the vanguard. At Colm, though, Van Damme was defeated and captured. Colm was matched with other setbacks. Along the Kotzbach River, a French corps was destroyed, and two drives on Berlin ended in defeat. As the coalition concentrated, Napoleon withdrew toward France. His German allies, demoralized by the war, deserted en masse. 
Napoleon lashed out. He blamed his men and his comrades. Napoleon accused Augereau of not living up to his exploits at Castiglione. Augereau yelled, Give me back the old soldiers of Italy, and I will show you who I am. On October 16th, at Leipzig, Napoleon's outnumbered army was pinned in place. The battle that raged outside the city was on a scale undreamt of. Napoleon had some 200,000 men and confronted nearly 400,000 coalition troops. So diverse were the armies involved that it was dubbed the Battle of Nations. The slaughter matched the scale. In four days of back-and-forth fighting, over 100,000 men were killed or wounded. At one point, Napoleon's artillery, placed on Gallows Heights, racked the coalition with fire. Napoleon later said, had I possessed 30,000 artillery rounds at Leipzig today, I would be master of the world. In the end, despite some spirited leadership, the bigger battalions carried the day. Napoleon began to withdraw on the morning of the third day, but the Elster River lacked enough bridges, and when the last one was blown on accident, it stranded thousands of soldiers. Many drowned in the crossing, including Poniatowski, who had recently been named a marshal. Most surrendered after hours of street fighting. The rest of the French army withdrew in good order, but there was no hiding the obvious. Napoleon's last chance to secure an empire was lost. He might have had peace. The Austrians were certainly willing to withdraw, since they could barely maintain their army in the field. Napoleon refused, and in doing so he had lost his last slim chance to retain power. The rest of his life after Leipzig was only a bloody anticlimax. The Napoleonic dream died at Leipzig.